All right, everybody. This <laughs> this has been a long time coming. I have a couple things I got to say before we get into this video. This, these are important things. Um, one, for the live chat viewers, if there's issues with the video, which is possible, I'm seeing symptoms of potential issues, I will record and upload it later. I'll fix it later. Just letting you know. But this video has been a long time coming. Um, Roman Catholic apologist Trent Horn has made six long video rebuttals of me, of my teaching content that I have online, because I have a lot of stuff dealing with Catholicism. So, I mean, for instance, you know, here's one of his videos from, you know, I guess over a year ago. There's another one, two hour video. Here's another one, uh, hour and a half. Here's ultimately six videos that he's done in response to me, and I haven't done anything in response to him. I've just I've just been busy. Some won't believe my my excuse there. That's just that's the honest truth. Today, for the first time though, I'm responding to to over eight hours and twelve seconds of content, responding to me. I'm actually just going to pick one video, the second one on the from the top of the screen there, that I will be responding to. Um, and for those who've been pushing for me for Mike Winger to debate Trent Horn in some sort of public debate, I'm going to be answering whether I will do that debate or not at the end of this video. And yeah. Yeah, I'm doing that to you. Well, hey, I worked hard on this stuff. I'd like you to take, take it into consideration. So these issues are super important. This is um, not just an in-house discussion. Uh, I'm anathematized by the Roman Catholic Church for the things I'm about to tell you here today. I'm anathematized. That, that means I'm like a curse from God. This is in the official teachings of the church. Whatever some particular Catholic might say, that's what the actual teachings, official councils say. So the, the, the gauntlet's been dropped down. And I think that the Roman Catholic teachings are unbiblical to the degree that it, it presents us with serious problems. Like it scares me for those who understand and hold to the actual teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, although I think most Catholics don't understand, thankfully. So this video is going to be long, but the reason why this video is going to be long is because I want to give you clarity. So I'm going to work through his response point by point. And we're going to especially focus on the topic of justification today. This is a complicated doctrine in Roman Catholicism, and it's most, almost always misunderstood in the debates between Christians, I should say, evangelicals, and Roman Catholics. So here we go. This is the first clip from Trent Horn that I'll be responding to. Let's get started here. And again, he's responding to me. I have a link to his video down below in the description. I'm not trying to hide any of that data from you all. I encourage you to check out the debate, consider it, think about it, but do it slowly and do it thoughtfully because you will be misled if you don't. All right, so here we go. This is the first clip. Hey, everyone. In today's rebuttal, I'm going to be talking about a video posted by Mike Winger and Alan Parr. They're two Protestant YouTubers. In the video, they talk about different groups that they identify as being cults or non-Christian groups that claim to be Christian, and one of them are Catholics. There's already a very significant, you're Mike, Mike, why are you interrupting him? Look, he made a claim. That was one capsulated claim. Now I'm going to respond. So there's already a very big problem with this. This is a complete misrepresentation of me. And it's, and it's, I don't know how, like Trent, I'm not, this is not an attack against Trent Horn personally. I'm probably going to try to call him Horn for the video because Trent also refers to the Council of Trent in the 16th century. So yeah, I'll probably try to refer to him as Horn or Trent Horn. At any rate, um, I didn't call Catholicism a cult. In fact, in the video, I specifically say, as you'll see, because he plays clips of it, I specifically say I don't call it a cult. So th this is this is a, an unfortunate thing. Um, his video, the title of it is Catholicism is a Cult, Rebuttal of Mike Winger and Alan Parr. Alan doesn't really contribute much to this video. He has other things he's said in that series we did. But um, this poisons the well. This causes you, if you're, if you're Roman Catholic, to think that I have just called you part of a cult. But I never said that. And so I think that Roman Catholics then feel offended by me. And my comment section reveals this, right? Because I, I, you guys attack me all the time in my comment section. So I think that it's Trent Horn that created the offense, not me. I didn't say Catholicism was a cult. Which is why when I uploaded this short video to my channel, I titled it, Catholicism isn't a cult, but I have serious concerns. Because I want to move off of the poisoning the well type stuff and onto the real issues. So let's go to the next clip. So without further ado, here's my rebuttal of Mike Winger and Alan Parr on Catholicism and showing that it is not a cult. It most certainly is Christian because it is the church that Jesus Christ himself established. Okay, just remind yourself here. <laughs> imagine the impact when you hear now twice within the first like 30 seconds that I've called it a cult when I never did. We're going to talk about Roman Catholicism. And while I would say groups one through four, we could identify as probably a, a cult. We would say those were 
cult groups. Roman Catholicism, I wouldn't put that label on it. I wouldn't put that label on it. So I'm playing now a clip from Trent Horn's video responding to me. So he plays my clips and his clips, and now I'm playing. This is like clipception going on here. But obviously, again, that's misrepresentation. Let's go to the next point. And when we say cult, we don't mean the um, Oxford Studies of Religion definition of cult, which is like any group with religious rituals is considered a cult in that definition. In Christian theology, that's and that is a legitimate discipline, scholarly discipline. In Christian theology, the term more to you know denotes someone claiming they're Christian, but they're diverting from Christianity on these essential truths. The term cult isn't helpful when you're talking about false religions. I use it sometimes to refer to groups that use extreme forms of manipulation, isolation, and coercion to keep people around. But otherwise, I think it's best just to acknowledge there are religions. It's what cult is, cultist, worship. And some of these religions are Christian, and some are not. Okay, so, uh, I mean, this is not, this wouldn't seem substantive for me to respond to. Normally, I would just ignore this point, because it seems like he's arguing over the definition of the t you know, proper use of the word cult. I'm like, why? I didn't even call Catholicism a cult. But I want to address it because I think that in Trent Horn's response, um, he often does this thing where he pauses and appears to disagree with me and correct me on minor insignificant issues. And that gives the impression that Trent Horn is, I think to the viewer, that he's in the place of like offering, you know, proper correction to this to this Protestant guy. And so I think it's worth responding for, for the... Um, rhetorical impact that it has so he does say it's not helpful when talking about false religions that's a, a second a, sep a separate issue i think it's helpful when you're talking to christians about false religions it helps them understand with clarity i wouldn't go to a false religion and immediately throw out cult so it depends on who i'm talking to he says he uses it and it's a non-technical or he uses it with a non-technical definition um and he does a religious group that's severely manipulative is not actually in the definition of the word cult, at least not on Webster. Okay, so Webster, which may change their definition after my video. You never know what they're going to do. But um, none of these definitions fit Trent's use, although the first one fits my, my use. I'm just showing you this. Yes, this is a real word. It really does mean this. Maybe that's changing in our culture. But this is historically, it's been used this way. A religion regarded as unorthodox or spurious. That's how I was using the term. And um, that I just doesn't seem like it's really worth spending a lot of time on it. Notice that it does not say anything about Trent Horn's definition. And the scholarly definition that I mentioned that some people get confused about is number three, a system of religious beliefs and ritual. Then it's referring to like the practices, the rituals themselves. All right, next clip. So when I talk about Roman Catholicism, I got to start and I have lots of hours on it, but I, I got to start by saying how much we agree on. Um, let's start with Jesus. Roman Catholic teaching is identical I mean, it's, it's right. It's correct on the person of Christ. It's identical to what I would believe, right? That Jesus is the son of God, second person of the Trinity. He's God incarnate. He died on the cross for your sin. Although in some Roman Catholic stuff, that's a little fuzzy on the details there. But he died on the cross for your sin. He rose bodily from the dead and he's coming to judge all people. We would agree with Roman Catholics with the very first creeds of the early church. Like these are the guys that came out of persecution, wouldn't give up their faith, and then they, you know, have the first earliest creeds of the church. And we would agree on all that. Amen. Some of the disagreement comes. Now, I don't want to discount that agreement. So if you said, is, is Roman Catholic Christian? Well, in a sense, yes, it is. Like, it holds to the person of Christ and following Christ and all that. There you go. So what's funny is that Trinhorn does play a clip where I affirm exactly the opposite of what he says I'm affirming in the title and in the opening of his video. This is this is why I don't think that, that his con his current contribution to the conversation is helpful because it's just misleading and confusing to people. But where it gets complicated and difficult is when we start talking about how salvation works in Roman Catholicism. So according to, the, and, and you can actually get to the nitty gritty of this because there's a lot of official teaching on the topic of salvation. Let me give you some summaries that I'm gonna admit Many Roman Catholic apologists are not going to like my summaries, but that's because they sound bad, okay? Not because they're not true. Like, I'm going to explain why I believe these things are actually accurate. Well, let's see if Winger is using blunt descriptions or just inaccurate ones. This is a key moment in the video. Um, the way that Trent, has, Trent Horn has set up the conversation, you'd expect that I'm either 
fulfilling my promise of giving you stuff that might sound blunt, but is but is accurate. It's really good. It's right, proper Catholic Roman Catholic theology. Or am I offering inaccurate descriptions? Um, Trinhorn's obviously leaning towards the latter. He thinks I'm offering inaccurate ones. The implication is that Mike gets Catholicism wrong. And um, let's remember this because it's all over my comment section on my videos. Ever since Trent Horn started doing his many videos about me, my videos show tons of Catholics coming in saying, Mike doesn't understand Catholicism. I often respond with, can you give an example of something I've misrepresented or misunderstood? And usually that's where the conversation ends or it detours into things that aren't really good examples. Um, let's remember this though, because the it's going to come up over and over again in the video. I'll say this. I don't think I even one time, um, to my knowledge, this isn't this isn't about me defending myself. This is about trying to evaluate myself here, my the rebuttal that I was given by uh, Trent Horn. I don't think that even one time you know, that I'm aware of that I genuinely misrepresented Roman Catholic views. But Trent Horn will lean on this, and if you follow the rhetoric and not the logic, which a lot of people do, you'll think I did as well because he kind of implies it over and over. So here is um, a rather complex waste of time. What happens next in the next clip from Trent Horn? Uh, I, I wouldn't spend any time on this, but he says it, so I'll respond. I don't want to be seen as um, ignoring something that somebody might think is substantive. But before I play this clip, I hope you guys have like your brains fully going. Like if you drank your coffee today, you're really ready to go. Because I want you to ask, do I really understand the logic of Mike's point? And do I really understand how Trent's point is a rebuttal of that? And again, Mike and Trent could be substituted with any two people in the world. What really matters are the issues. Because it's about God, it's about Jesus, it's about the truth of the gospel and understanding what it means to be forgiven and how that takes place. So here we go. Do you, do you get my point? Do you understand Trent's response and does it actually work? So they would say Jesus is necessary for salvation, but he's not sufficient. Grace is needed for salvation, but grace is not enough for salvation. Your works help earn your salvation. A while back, Mike Winger did a video on why Calvinism is unbiblical. Now, Calvinists would say that Mike is the one who doesn't think Jesus or grace are sufficient for salvation. That's because Calvinists believe that Jesus died on the cross only for the people going to heaven. And God alone makes it so that you become Christian and stay Christian. You do not have a free choice in the matter at all. So they would say to Mike, Mike, if you're saying you can reject God's offer of salvation. You're saying Jesus isn't enough. Grace isn't enough. You've turned faith into a work. And here's Mike's response to that criticism. Calvinists are going to start to say that because you believed, if you think you believed based upon a decision you made, and I don't even mean without the help of God, right? With God helping you, with, with the Holy Spirit working in your heart, with the gospel being proclaimed to you and God drawing you, but you made a free will choice. Like you could have accepted it, you could have rejected it, you chose to accept it, that's synergism. You did some of the work. And here's where I go, wrong. Didn't we just go through a bunch of scriptures that says faith is not a work? So don't say that my choice to believe makes me a synergist in regards to salvation because it starts to be a switcheroo. So I would agree with Mike that just because I have to do something in order to be saved, it doesn't follow that I have now made Jesus or grace unnecessary or insufficient. I think that's radically confused and I'd like to explain why. So first, just so we understand my point, okay? <laughs> my original point was this. I wasn't talking about Calvinism. It was about the Roman Catholic doctrine of how salvation works. I say that they say works help you earn your your final salvation. Okay, they help you earn your salvation. This is this is Canon 32 from the Council of Trent. This is considered infallible by Roman Catholics. It says if anyone says that the good works, notice they're called works, not not faith. The works of the one justified are in such manner the gifts of God that they're not also the good merits of him justified or that the one justified by the good works that he performs by the grace of God and the merit of Jesus Christ, whose living member he is does not truly merit an increase of grace and eternal life. And in case he dies in grace, the attainment of eternal life itself and also an increase of glory, let him be anathema. This, this is the statement of like, hey, look, if you don't think that my good works help me merit grace and finally eternal life, then you're anathema. You're a curse from God. Okay, this is not about faith. This is about works. Now, his points are, this, this feels like such a distraction. Like, I'm, forgive me if you get confused here. You should get confused. It's confusing. His point has no relevance to the actual debate, but let's walk through it. 
His points are one, Calvinists claim that I, Mike, turns faith into a work. I turn faith into a work. Uh, point two, Mike says, me, I say that faith is something you do, but it's not a work. And I build a whole biblical case for this. This is true that not everything you do is properly called a work because it isn't earning anything. It isn't meriting anything. Uh, there is no exchange of labor for benefit. There's no work for reward, right? So yes, you do faith, but faith isn't a work. So, so it's not threatening grace. His conclusion then is number three, therefore we can do things to cooperate with God. Okay, but that's the most vague thing on the planet. It, and it ignores my actual distinction of faith is not a work. That's why it's not a threat to grace. So here comes the equivocation. Point four, Trinhorn says, uh, therefore, we're not saying grace is insufficient. Um, the equivocation is this. If, look, if you get confused, it's just confusing. It's not your fault. Right? If doing something isn't inherently a threat to grace then us saying we do works isn't a threat to grace. That, that's, that's right. He gets from me, doing something's not a threat to grace, right? Therefore, doing works isn't a threat to grace. But the whole reason my entire case is based on the idea that faith is not a work, that's why it doesn't threaten grace. So this is a big red herring because the Catholic Church expressly affirms that you do works to merit grace. Not just faith, works. So again, it's just a big, a big waste of time. Um, let's see here. Um, yeah, there's so much more I could talk about. We're going to be getting to a lot of scripture today, but let me just take one of the verses or a couple of verses real quick that I think are really relevant to the discussion. Understand how at least me as a Protestant, if you're a Roman Catholic, I'm framing this issue. Um, and Trent Horn will address this, this verse directly later on. Uh, Paul talks about our salvation, says that it is by grace. And if it's by grace, then it's not of works. And then you're like, well, what if, what if I say it's of grace and works? Well, he says, well, then grace is no longer grace, right? Because if it's by grace and not works, that makes sense. That's logical. That's just what grace means. Grace means not works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And if it's of works, it's no longer of grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Now, this is a, a hugely important verse to me. It's suggesting that Paul's defining terms here, kind of like I defined the word cult and how I was using it. He's defining grace and works, and he's suggesting they're mutually exclusive. If it's by works, it's not by grace. If it's by grace, it's not by works. And Roman Catholicism says it's both. There's my complaint in a nutshell. All right, now let's, uh, it's going to get way more deep here. Let's go to the next clip. So I would agree with Mike that just because I have to do something in order to be saved, it doesn't follow that I have now made Jesus or grace unnecessary or insufficient. See, this is, again, the equivocation. Just because I have to do something. Well, look, if the thing you do is not a work, then it doesn't threaten grace. I'm consistent here. He suggests that because I say that, you can therefore do works and it doesn't threaten grace. This is not helping you guys, and it's not helping Roman Catholicism. It's confusing people about these really important issues. And I think that if Roman Catholic, the one thing I wish Roman Catholics and Protestants would do in their public discussions is at least have clarity, right? Not, not turn into wacky, weird redefining of words and equivocation. Cause that, I don't know about you guys. Look, I want to believe truth. If I'm going to be Roman Catholic, I would be full on totally committed Roman Catholic. And I wouldn't equivocate on the terms. Um, and I'd recommend we, we all hold our faith genuinely. I think that that would be our sincere attempt to honor God in those things. Um, I also never said anything about it being unnecessary, but we'll we'll skip that. Um, I, you, and you might think, okay, you might think I'm nitpicking. I never said grace uh, was unnecessary. I, I specifically said that grace is necessary in Roman Catholicism. But you get the idea. You listen to me talk about it. Once you listen to Trent Horn, you don't even know what Mike believes anymore, let alone what Trent Horn's trying to promote. And that's the confusion that this breeds. Let's go to the next clip because I'd like to get into more substantive stuff. So keep that in mind when Mike criticizes Catholics for promoting works salvation, because he agrees that Christians do something. They cooperate with God, and that cooperation with grace and with Christ in no way makes God's grace or Christ's sacrifice insufficient. Because faith is not a work, but Roman Catholicism teaches works. So you can't Here's what, what I, I would say Trent Horn should not do here, logically speaking, right? We shouldn't pretend that my statement that faith is not a work, therefore it doesn't threaten grace, somehow translates into works are okay to mix with grace. That's weird. All right, next clip. 
Now, once I say that, things get real complicated if you're talking to an informed Catholic, because they're going to tell you, oh, I, I've heard it seen this many times, right? Especially the current Catholic apologists who tend to say, are you kidding? We believe a person could just put their faith in Jesus, right? And then, and, and they've done no good works and they die and then they go to heaven. And we believe that. And you're like, wait, what? But, but Mike told me that you guys thought works were needed. Well, here's why it's complicated because they separate salvation into two different stages. We didn't do that. The Bible and common sense. Okay. He said the Bible and common sense did. I don't know why some of these clips are cutting off just a bitterly. Um, now, again, let me just point out, uh, Trinhorn's not rebutting me yet. He's agreeing with me uh, that I'm that I, I'm correct to say that Catholicism separates salvation into two stages, initial and final justification, and they're on two different grounds. They're two different ways of achieving salvation on those two stages. I'm only being accurate here, I believe, with Roman Catholic theology. Um and I think this is where Roman Catholic apologists sometimes confuse people because they're not clear on which stage they're talking about. And yeah, he says the Bible and common sense does. So let's now listen to some of the way he defends this, his stages of salvation. Listen carefully. Let's really consider the logic here and give it any credit it has and any refutation it might need. So if someone can fall away, it makes sense that there are two stages to salvation, initial and final. In Romans 13, 11, Paul says, salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. That implies a change in moving towards our salvific goal. A change in moving towards our salvific goal. Okay, so there are uh, two reasons he gives here to support his two-stage salvation theory, and, or the Roman Catholic teaching on the topic. And the first one is, uh, if you can fall away, it makes sense that there are two stages of salvation. Now, I'm going to push back on this and suggest that this is a this we're we're confusing concepts here a little bit so if someone can fall away it doesn't necessarily mean there are two stages in the sense of two different ways of attaining obtaining salvation initially we get it by grace alone and then finally we get it by grace plus works that's roman catholicism falling away just means you can get that grace and then you can give it up that doesn't create see this means there are two different um uh you know, the moments initially receiving salvation, if you can fall away on the hypothesis, you truly can fall away. You receive salvation. Let's say you apostatize. You, you, you depart from the faith. You reject Christ. And then you lose salvation. You didn't lose it because of works. You lost it because of faith. The same way you got in is how you got out. And the same way you got in is how you'd stay in faith. It, on the theory that you can lose salvation there. So yeah, this is a point uh, Trent Horn makes many times uh, in a lot of different ways. But it confuses two different ways of obtaining salvation for two different time periods of, of, of experiencing salvation, initially and finally. Uh, stage one on Roman Catholicism, you receive it by grace alone. Stage two, grace must have works added to it or you're dead, right? <laughs> or, or you're not making it. You go from faith to a place of grace plus works, which I think means no more grace. So that's a non sequitur. Uh, the second reason is to say that our salvation is nearer than we first believed. This is a quote from Romans 13, and I'll take us there. Again, again, this this confuses uh, something. I think my understanding is that to say that if you're nearer now than when you first believed, right, then that means that salvation has two stages. Two stages meaning two different ways of obtaining initial and final salvation. No, no, no. That all it means is salvation, which we experience when we believe in Christ, has further experiences, not ways of obtaining it, but further experiences ahead of us, such as. When, we, when Jesus comes in glory. And that's closer than when it once was. And that's the context of Romans 13. Um, the Roman Catholic view, according to Trent Horn here, is that when you first believe, you're, you're, you're guaranteed to be saved. Later on, it's in question, depending on your works. And Paul is only saying it's closer now, right? It's, it's still guaranteed. It's just closer now on a timeline. It's nearer. So this is equiv equivocation again, in my opinion. Um, salvation is forgiveness of sin and right standing with God and it's secured in Christ and it's just our heavenly experience is coming closer now whereas they would look at it as a different grounds for how you are finally going to be entering into salvation let me give you an example this is a great verse for this in my opinion Romans 5 verses 1 and 2 talks about not just how we get saved but how we stay saved right that second experience therefore having been justified by faith that's how I get my salvation. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. No works are involved here. It's faith and grace. In Romans, Paul's clear. Faith and grace, that means no works, right? Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. I have continual access to the grace of God by just trusting in Jesus. I have faith in him, and therefore I stand in grace. I start with grace, I continue in grace, and I rejoice uh, for the future glory that's coming my way. Praise God. All right, here's the next clip. Stage one salvation, they call initial justification. Stage two salvation, final justification or or you know you're you've you've actually get to heaven later on and that difference is important for us to understand so stage one initial salvation it's said to be by faith alone and not with any works that you perform it does require baptism baptism is required on catholic teaching but they'll say that's not a work and then it's just you're saved by faith alone and, and baptism usually applies to new babies or, or little little babies right or new converts to catholicism but if you've been a catholic for longer than you know a few months or a few years or something if you were an infant and you were baptized once you get old enough to be an adult you're on stage two salvation you are not on i'm saved by believing and getting baptized which i don't think baptism is required for salvation but that is the teaching of the catholic church so that's not just catholic teaching though it's biblical teaching. Okay, I want to point this out again. Um, I'm not. I'm not here being shown to be inaccurate. He actually heard my description of Roman Catholic salvation, and he just affirmed it as as saying it was biblical. Uh, I, I want to say this because again, if you were following the rhetoric, not the logic, the rhetoric of you know Trinhorn's video, then you might be thinking that I was being inaccurate in my description of Roman Catholicism. And just to be honest, on a personal note, like. I've spent countless hours working very hard to try to understand Roman Catholic theology and, and represent it correctly. And to be casually, you know, dismissed as misrepresenting it is, is not helping. <laughs> so, um, so he actually says, no, it's biblical. He has not disagreed with any of my descriptions so far. I just want that to be understood. Now, here's his defense of baptismal regeneration, which is not the topic of my video at all, but he gets into the issue, so I'll respond. It's biblical teaching. For example, 1 Peter 3.21 says, Baptism now saves us. Here's what Martin Luther said about baptism. What a great, excellent thing baptism is, which delivers us from the jaws of the devil and makes us God's own, suppresses and takes away sin, and then daily strengthens the new man. And this is what Luther said about baptism being a work, or more specifically, how baptism is not a work that earns salvation. Yes, our works indeed avail nothing for salvation. Baptism, however, is not our work, but God's. All right, so um, this is his defense of baptismal regeneration. We'll talk about it briefly. I know there's other stuff that he would suggest and he would bring. He would try to bring church history arguments, but I would argue with those as well. And so that would just, you know, expand the discussion. I'll just respond to what he said. And he says, baptism now saves us. That, he quotes actually First Peter, but I don't know if you noticed this. He's quoting a very select portion of the verse. Um, so Peter talks about how they were how they were saved in Noah's day in First Peter three twenty um, through through going through water through the ark. Right, they were saved going through the water in the, during the flood. And then verse twenty one, there's an anti type which now saves us, baptism. Um, now he he put you know he said baptism now saves you uh, now saves us, but there's more to the verse than that because here's the thing this. If Peter just said that by itself, baptism saves us, that would be pretty challenging for someone like me who doesn't hold to baptismal regeneration, as plenty of people in church history did not, although Roman Catholics will tell you otherwise. Um, so I'd expect a caveat, and it's on your screen, you can read it. The caveat's right there. Peter's making sure that you don't misunderstand his point and think he means that the water process, the by the working of the work, <laughs> the dipping of, in the water, that that's how you get saved. So he says, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. He's not talking about the water thing, right? He's talking about what? The answer of a good conscience towards God, which is, which is a heart issue. So baptism is the representation of the answer, the water baptism, of the answer of the good conscience toward God. I think Peter guards us against this use of his text in the part of the verse that, that was not quoted. So Peter says, express, it seems to expressly say, this is not what I'm talking about. I don't mean water baptism regenerates uh, the, the, and, and saves people. The outward thing, I'm talking about the inward thing that it represents. That's what saves you. And that would be my understanding of baptism as well. 
We could also point to things like the thief on the cross um, in Acts 10. I could look at Cornelius, who was clearly 100% inarguably, if you study the passage carefully, he was absolutely saved and filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues. He was saved before he was baptized, right? The thief on the cross was saved before he was baptized. That's not, and you could call that baptism in blood, but let's just, let's just, yeah, I, I think that's uh, a stretch. <laughs> um, Paul in First Corinthians, he says that he he's he's thankful he didn't come to baptize but to preach the gospel. But wait, if 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 the baptism is essential to be saved, how could he not consider that part of the gospel? Right, baptizing people, they're not saved until they're baptized. And he says, I came to preach the gospel, not to baptize. He was thankful he didn't baptize more of them because they were making too big of a thing of it um, as far as who did the baptizing. Now, I have a link below in the description, or I will put one, where I did a four-hour debate on the topic of baptism uh, discussion with a friend of mine, Dean Meadows, and I'll put that down there below if you guys want to follow up on that more. Uh, the next thing Trenhorn does is he quotes Martin Luther. Now, Trenhorn does this regularly. Um, he always quotes Protestants whenever possible in his books and in debates and in things like that. Um, I, I find this to be very useful rhetorically, but not useful in providing clarity. Um, because, for instance, the quote here, I'll put it on your screen. The quote here from Trent, from um, Martin Luther is that baptism is not our work, but God's. Okay, so Luther is again affirming that works don't save us in any way, shape, or form. Luther held to baptismal regeneration because he had, I think, leftover stuff from Roman Catholicism and, and the dominant views of his time. But, uh, but again, baptism... He says it's not our work, but God. So he doesn't consider baptism a work that we perform. And that's why it can be seen as not conflicting with grace. So this is consistent with my same theology. This is why those who hold to baptism regeneration, I don't, I don't say that they're apostate. I think they're wrong because I don't think they view it as a work. It's not seen as a, something I'm performing to achieve God's earn or merit. Let's just say merit, God's grace. No, no, it's, it's, it's seen as a, just a, a demonstration of faith. So this is mostly a distraction. Um, this Martin Luther quote has nothing to do with the actual issue we're discussing and debating, which is going to be the place of works in meriting eternal life, uh, which they have no place unless they're the works of Christ only. So Trent Horn's now going to summarize his summary. It, it, the, the way I okay, the way I hear it, it sounds as though it's a rebuttal to me, but he's not. He's agreeing with me again. So rhetorically, feels like I'm being refuted. Actually, he's just agreeing with me. Let's just play the clip. So it's a firm biblical principle that our initial salvation comes solely by grace. It isn't a work. The Catechism says, Since the initiative belongs to God in the order of grace, no one can merit the initial grace of forgiveness and justification at the beginning of conversion. That's what I said. <laughs> so it's just mere agreement. Again, let's just remind you. Well, let's see if Winger is using blunt descriptions or just inaccurate ones. Yep, some blunt ones. Not not yet inaccurate anyways. I mean, not even on Trent Horn's own case. Like, he hasn't yet accused me of an inaccuracy uh, in that regard. So the psychological impact of, of this uh, is... I. I call it, and I call it this one, I've called it this when atheists do it. They'll take my videos and do refutations of them where they pause and pontificate. And it's where you, pa that's what I call it, pause and pontificate. I know Roman Catholic, <laughs> no pun intended there. Um, but they'll just, you know, you, you play a clip of somebody, you pause, you disagree with them on some minor issue, you nitpick them, and then you play, and then you nitpick them, and you play. And it feels like you've rebutted them, but you haven't actually tackled the substance of their arguments. And that is what I think is happening here. It's, I think it's pausing and pontificating. Uh, I'm trying to deal with his actual substantive arguments. It's up to you what you're going to think about this. I'm presenting this to you for your intelligent consideration. And we will look at the next clip here. Um, yeah, I think the psychological impact um, is that people, especially if you're if you if you are Roman Catholic and you 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 feel that Trent Horn's on your side, right? Is to feel like Mike's being corrected a lot, even if I don't follow all the reasons. And I think that that's the real impact of the video. I don't think it's it, it's not increasing clarity. It's just uh, servicing a certain audience. So now we're getting into nitty gritty. What happens next? This is nitty gritty. This is real theological disagreement here. Notice how I explain. I'm asking you to consider these things. I'm gonna in the video he plays with me. I explain Roman Catholic final salvation where works are involved, and then notice how Trent Horn responds. This is real theology. It requires real thinking. I just want you to make sure you understand what's being said here, because then we're gonna unpack it, and it, hopefully it'll be fruitful for you. Um, stage two salvation is where the problems show up. So let me talk about stage two. 
this is where, and I'm going to quote official Roman Catholic sources so people know I'm not trying to misrepresent it. I think this is very important stuff. And the Roman Catholic Church historically thought this was important. They said that people who don't agree with them on this are accursed from God. So that's kind of them making, throwing down the gauntlet on this topic. So we should know about it. Many Catholics don't know what I'm about to share with you guys. So don't approach them as though they do. But let me talk about the official teaching. Your acts of righteousness according to Roman Catholic teaching, are not just fruit of the work of God in your life, like I do good things because God's Holy Spirit is working in me. Rather, they're also something that merits or earns final salvation. In um, the Council of Trent, the Council of Trent, it says the following thing. If anyone says that the good works of the one justified are in such manner the gifts of God that they are not also the good merits of him justified, or that the one justified by the good works that he performs by the grace of God and the merit of Jesus Christ, whose living member he is, does not truly merit, listen to this phrase, merit an increase of grace, eternal life, and in case he dies in grace, the attainment of eternal life itself, and also an increase of glory. If you don't say all that, let him, if you do say against those things, then let him be anathema. What the council is saying here is that you can't believe that the good works we do have absolutely nothing to do with us, and that in choosing to do them through the grace of God, they don't actually affect us in any way. You can't believe that. That's that's nonsense, okay? I, I got to call this out for what it is, because it's not uh, an issue between me and uh, Trent Horn here. It's an issue between both of us, I guess, and you. Um, that's not what the council's saying. The first person who so far in this video has been guilty of misrepresenting Roman Catholic teaching is absolutely Trent Horn, 100%. And you can you can look at the canon itself. This is canon 32, again, the same one I just read on screen. Um, my software is a little delayed. So that's why you're hearing audio sometimes and you don't get the video right away. But that, I don't know why that is and I can't fix it all right now. So, um, but the uh, this is not, according to Trent Horn, let me quote him word for word. He says, the, the, the council is saying, quote, you can't believe that the good works we do have absolutely nothing to do with us. No, this is not what the council's saying, and it's not my complaint. What he's doing is he's, he's, uh, he's watering down the issue so that it's something you, I can't argue against. Of course, your good works have something to do with you. No, how could anyone argue? They're your good works. Of course, they have something to do with the you that is your <laughs> that's doing the good works. Um, or he says alternately, and I quote, that they don't actually affect us in any way. Of course, your good works affect you in ways. Th this is difficult because it's not dealing with the issues. It's seeming to offer correction, but all he's done is he's water he's lowered the bar. So that, that uh, as if Roman Catholicism is saying, good works have something to do with us and they affect us. And then the Protestants are like, no, they don't. But this is, of course, not the debate at all. Um, Canon 32 says that we are justified, quote, justified by the good works that he performs and quote, truly merit an increase of grace, eternal life, dot, dot, dot here, and the attainment of eternal life itself. Trent Horn did not defend, and he didn't even acknowledge what the council is actually teaching here. This is a debate tactic that confuses people into agreeing with you. You think, I agree with him that our works have something to do with us and they affect our, us, our souls. Well, I do too, guys. That's not the debate at all. Um, yeah, so next he's going to switch from vague generalities to de a defense of the Roman Catholic view that your works are needed to help merit your final salvation. Again, he's not so far demonstrated that there's anything inaccurate in my descriptions. I think that's important because I want to make sure I um, acknowledge that if he does. And we will take these things one passage at a time. Here's the defense of the Roman Catholic view um, from Trent Horn. You can't believe that because it violates what the Bible says about justification. James 2.24 says, A man is justified by works and not by faith alone. When James says this, he's talking about the increase in our righteousness that happens after we've been baptized. Okay, the, 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 that's all he says about James 2. We're going to actually have to go to James 2 to get into it in more detail. Um, he, he quotes James 2, one verse, and says, you know, when James, quoting Trent Horn, when James says this, he's talking about the increase of our righteousness that happens after we've been baptized, second stage salvation, justification by works. All right. Now, I think that in this passage in James 2, where he mentions us being uh, justified by works, I, I think that the word justified, and I have a link below for a full video teaching on this topic, James chapter 2, it's in the video description, or it will be if it's not there already. I'll double check after the stream. 
Um, but in this in this um, passage, the where it talks about being justified by works, <laughs> I think the word justified is being used to refer to proving something to other people, showing yourself to be sincere, legitimate, honest, real. Um, and so we can, I think, demonstrate that. Uh, let me first show you this. The Bible does use the word justified that way. Um, sometimes we are guilty of importing theological definitions of words into the text where justification is part of soteriology and you don't realize it's also just part of the Greek language. It's just how people talk. How do you justify that claim? I don't mean how do you get it to heaven, right? I mean, how do you prove it true? So here's an example of a verse. Um, Wanting to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Right? The man wants to justify himself. He's not, he's not talking about soteriology here. He's talking about prove that he is in the right. That's how it's being used in that verse. Then we have um, Luke 16, 15. Yeah, it's the same word in the Greek as J James uses. Um, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. Oh, that's interesting, right? They're just, they, they try to make themselves look good and look right before men to appear legitimate, appear true, but God knows their hearts. Okay, that's the same thing. Proving something to people. That's Luke 10, 29, Luke 16, 15. In Mark eleven nineteen, Jesus, um, oh, I guess I'm in the wrong, oh, it was Matthew eleven nineteen. Jesus says that wisdom is justified by her children. Now this is referring, I'm trying to, I'm trying to speed through some of this stuff because it's going to be a long video. Uh, Jesus is referring to here uh, how John the Baptist abstained from things and how Jesus enjoyed them. John the Baptist wouldn't drink, Jesus drank. He didn't get drunk, but he did drink alcohol. And... Um, uh, John the Baptist refrained from eating lots of foods. Jesus would eat whatever, although he never was immodest with it or, or gluttonous. So he says wisdom is justified by her children. Uh, and what he's saying is we're both walking in paths of wisdom and our lives will demonstrate that that was true. He's pr it's about proving things before men. It's not about getting right before God. Ah, that's the thing. It, uh, Luke 7.35 is another passage where we get the same thing. Now let's go back to James. I just have, I think, demonstrated that justification can be used in refer reference to proving before men, not before God, not being right before God, but proving yourself legitimate before mankind. Here's how I think James uses it. And let's look at it in, in context. James 2, 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? That guy. Can faith save who? The guy who says he has faith but when you look at his life, right, he doesn't have works. That's the hypothetical. So we have a claim to have faith, but we don't have works that demonstrate that faith to justify the claim before mankind. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you don't give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit, right? Did you even mean it or was it an empty claim? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James is concerned about people who say they believe in Jesus, but they don't live it out. He's worried that their faith might actually just be dead faith, faith that doesn't save. Notice it's still the faith that saves, it's still the faith. But the response James expects is in verse 18. Some will say, you, James, James has faith, um, or excuse me, uh, you, the, the listeners, the, the, the person who believes but does no works, that you have faith and James, James has works. right? But he's not trying to do that. James is going to refute that. He's going to say, look, I'm not suggesting here that that I'm 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 overturning faith with this idea of works. Here's how he's using works as a demonstration. Show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. Again, James is concerned with proving to people, not God, proving to people that the claim to believe in Jesus is real. And your lifestyle shows that you mean it when you say I believe in Jesus. This is something Protestants have pretty much always said, so this is not new. Then he says, you do well, you believe that there's one God? Well, if, so if you counter and go, I don't have any works, I don't seem to live the Christian life, but I say I believe. Well, he goes, well, pff, even the demons believe and tremble. And now I want to push back on Trent Horn's interpretation of James. He said, and I quote, James is talking about the increase in our righteousness that happens after we've been baptized. Notice James never mentions baptism. He doesn't mention increase in righteousness. These are terms foreign to James too. He does, however, suggest that some people have the same belief that demons believe, which implies they were never saved, just like demons were never saved. James is not talking about second salvation. He's not talking about, you know, the second stage that Roman Catholicism is. He's talking about people that are just saved at all. 
So he compares them to demons who intellectually believe, but there isn't real true faith. Verse 20, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Now, this is the phrase where justified, I think, mean, means proved before men. So Abraham offers Isaac years after God declares him justified and righteous before God. The Isaac in, instant is a demonstration of Abraham's faithfulness to God. It didn't create it. Abraham was already declared righteous. This simply shows us, shows everyone, that his claim to believe in God is real. So that justification is just proving himself true. It's not soteriological. Do you see that faith was, was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect or complete? And scripture has, was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So I, I could go on with, um, with this, but uh, again, James's concern throughout this passage, I think should be clear to everyone, I hope, is that he wants you to prove to man that your faith claim is real. And the way you do that is by showing your life is consistent with that belief. Just like Abraham showed through offering Isaac that he really was believing God. It's a demonstration of belief. It's not about second salvation stage. So um, let's go to the next clip. This is where he uses Romans 2. And this to me is, I have a, I have a Bible study in Romans 2. I call it the most misunderstood book in the misunderstood passage in the entire book of Romans, and this is why. Here's clip 18. Paul says in Romans 2, glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. It's not the hearers, but the doers. Now, there's no more commentary that he's going to give on this, so I can't respond to further stuff. But I, he brought up the verses. He quoted them. So I, I would like to uh, give a thoughtful um, interaction on them. He says, whoever calls on the Lord will be saved. Excuse me. Um, here we go. I have verses 2, 10, and 13. Oh, I'm on 10. That's why. 2, 10. This is the verse that he quotes, and, and if, I think it strikes a lot of people here in Romans 2, that God's going to give glory, honor, and peace to everyone who what? Who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That would seem to make the point. This On the surface, you read the verse by itself, it seems very much to make that point. Um, you could try to spin a little bit or, or respond, I should say, a little bit by saying, well, those people who work are just... Um, there, it's just a symptom of their faith, so they happen to be working, but the working is not earning the salvation or the or the peace and the glory and the honor. But I, I have a different response that I'd like to give. But first, I'll show verse thirteen. He says, "Not the hearers of the law are just in God's sight, but the doers of the law will be justified." For this, I want to recommend plucking verses out of Romans two is just generally not a good idea. Uh, Paul's developing an argument for. Well, several chapters, but especially the first three chapters are part of a flowing, continuous argument. Chapter one, he says, everyone has sinned. Chapter two, he says, hey, um, if you want to use the law, if you want to use righteousness, you have to be perfectly righteous. And then God will give you glory, honor, and all that. It's a hypothetical. Then in chapter three, he goes on to show that this law-based salvation, right? This is doers of the law will be justified. This is how you get justified through the law, that this doesn't work for anyone. Because as you read on, and we'll, we'll go to chapter 3, and we'll go to verse 9, starting in verse 9. This is where he concludes after he says all that. Are we better than they? What then? Uh, not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Right? He just said if you obey the law, then you have this glory, honor, eternal life. But, but everyone hasn't. That's Paul's conclusion in, in chapter 3. Nobody has obeyed it. So that's why this passage is so misused. Um, as it is written, he goes on, there's none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside and together become unprofitable. There is no one who does good, no, not one. Is Paul really saying that your good works are going to be justifying you? No, he's, he's saying if you can be righteous enough, your works would justify you. But your works won't because y'all suck, right? Like everybody is a sinner. Nobody will achieve that standard. So he goes on and explains, their throat's an open tomb, with their tongues they have practiced deceit, their poison of asps, those are like poisonous serpents, is under their lips. 
whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Like, if you want to see how wicked mankind is, like, just go look at TikTok for 10 seconds or hit the trending tab on YouTube. Like, <laughs> that's all you need to know. Verse nine, 19, now we know that whatever the law says, remember, that was salvation according to the law, being just, being right, works, fulfill the law. Now, we know whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so they can be saved? No, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And then verse 20, Paul has a big conclusion about the whole hypothetical of chapter two that Trent Horn was presenting as if it was our real path to salvation. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Right? When you take this and you combine it with the verse Trent Horn quoted in Romans 2.13, he says, the, the, not the hearers, but the doers of the law will be justified, right? Well, then you, then you go to, um, uh, right there, <laughs> verse 13. No, I already did that. You go compare this to 3.20, um, and you're going to see you need a righteousness apart from the law. This is, this is in verse 21, I guess. I highlighted a good spot there on accident. You, it's, the, the deeds of the law, no one will be justified, Right? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So you need a righteousness apart from the law. Right, That righteousness will be by faith. That, that righteousness is going to come of, from God through faith in Christ to all and on all who believe. Because everyone's sin and everyone's going to be justified freely by his grace. Don't you understand? Paul is refuting the idea that Trent Horn is trying to promote here. Uh, that Roman Catholicism is trying to promote. More importantly, um, Roman Catholicism is trying to promote. It's a big, 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 big deal. When you look at all these verses together, you realize that uh, you can't boast. <laughs> the boasting is excluded by a law of works. No, 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 by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude. We conclude. How do we get to the end of this thing that Paul's been saying for three chapters? A man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So this is absolutely contrary to the use of Romans 2.10 and 2.13 that Trent Horn was, was doing. The gospel is contrasted with what Trent Horn was saying in his last clip, not, not established as that thing. It's a, it's a contrast. Um, let me play really quick to remind you. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Right. That's if you're under the law. But Paul concludes that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Read the whole book of Romans, not just chapter 2. Por favor. All right, let's look at um, this next one is a real disagreement between us. This is a big issue. I'm going to labor on this issue for a while because I think that a lot of our discussions, when you really debate back and forth with a, with a really informed Roman Catholic, it really comes down to this, this idea of merit. So Trent Horn's going to really push back on me. I, I used merit and earn as synonyms. If you merit something, you earn it. That's what I said, right? And he's going to really push back. Now, there's a reason why I said it that way, and I'll explain that as we go. But here's a real, a real defense of his position, and I'm going to say he's, I believe, misrepresenting Roman Catholic teaching. And, and if you guys think I'm being arrogant or pompous or something, I just think this is true. I've spent a lot of time on this. I've read the councils. I've studied the Council of Trent's Doctrine of Justification. I've studied the Roman Catholic definition of merit. I've bought the, I've, I've looked into ancient scholastic common uh, uh, dictionaries <laughs> for, for what medieval scholastics were thinking about the word merit. And I've even emailed like Harvard professors to ask them what these medieval scholastics meant by merit in the Council of Trent. And I'm going to share with you some of the fruit of the labor there. I think that Trent Horn's misrepresenting it. I think he's the one, unfortunately, that's guilty of misrepresenting Catholicism. Now, I know Trent's worded weird, because what they do is they say, if you say this thing we don't like, then you're anathema. In that is an affirmation. What they're saying is, you know, Alan, if you're Catholic, you know, you get baptized as an infant, most likely, but you're not, you're not an infant anymore. I'm pretty sure you're a little older than that. Now you need to do good works. You're going to, and those good works will merit an increase of grace. Now, this, from a biblical perspective, is an incoherent statement. You don't merit grace. How'd you get that grace? Well, I earned it. <laughs> Wait, what? Right. Then, it's, then it's not grace. To earn something means that after doing a work, the other party is legally obligated to pay you. To merit something means that after doing the work, 
the compensation is given because of the work, but it's not legally owed. When my yard guy mows my lawn, he earned the money I'm going to pay him. I have to pay him. When my five-year-old picks up the leaves in order to help, I might give him a treat. I don't legally have to give him a treat. And if he had a snotty attitude acting like he legally deserved it, I might not give him a treat. But if my son genuinely pleases me through a good work, then as his father, I recognize he merited a reward, but he didn't earn it. So when it comes to salvation, you cannot earn God's grace. But our actions as God's children can merit an increase in the justification we received at baptism. All right, let's understand how this logic works. My point is simple. I take 10 seconds to explain it. Look, hey, if you add works to grace, it's not grace anymore. Right? If you add grace to works, well, then that's not works anymore. They're, they're, um, they're, it's a true dichotomy. You can't have works and grace combined because you worked for it. It wasn't grace. Um, so, but Trent Horn's response is to hang on the word earn. Uh, the Catholic Church will affirm that you work for salvation. But, they, but he's going to say the word earn doesn't belong in there. And so his point is to say earn and merit have two different definitions. They're very different. Let's make sure we understand his point clearly here. I don't want to misrepresent him. Um, earn is, quote, after doing a work, the other party's legally obligated to pay you. Now, if you've ever used the word earn in a sentence, you probably didn't mean legally obligated to pay. That's probably not what you meant by the word earn. And if you look at look up the word earn on, say, I don't know, a normal English dictionary like Webster here, you're not going to see that as one of the definitions. Uh, once my software lets it load, man, my computer must be taxed at the moment. The, um, the definitions of earn do not include legally obligatory. Well, the word legal is not in there. So to receive as return for effort and especially for work done or services rendered, that sounds like merit to me to bring in by way of return, to come to a duly worthy or entitled or suited to, to make worthy of or obtain for. Okay, this seems, in fact, if you go in, on Webster and you scroll down to synonyms for the word earn, guess what shows up? Or excuse me, synonyms for the word merit, pardon me, it, earn is there. So if you, if you go to merit and look at synonyms, the word earn shows up. Think about this for a second. What, what's happening here is we have a Roman Catholic apologist who's defining merit in a way that does not fit with Roman Catholic teaching. But it's a way that I think helps build bridges with Protestants because it makes it sound like it's not actually a threat to grace. But it's, it's I think, purely a talking point that's not su supported. He says merit should be defined as after doing the work of the compensation is given because of the work, but it's not legally owed. Okay, this to me makes little sense. Um, again, normal English definitions of words. These two are synonyms of each other. But let's say that we take Trent Horn's definition and evaluate it more. I'm going to tell you I have nine problems, <laughs> probably 10 problems. I have nine problems with this definition of merit. And I spent a lot of time on this because it's not just Trent Horn. Jimmy Aiken also presents merit as meaning, he defines it as meaning not earned. Now, this does not fit Roman Catholic teaching. These are, I believe, and I'm open to correction here, but I've spent a lot of time on this. I believe Roman Catholic apologists are presenting content that's inconsistent with Roman Catholicism because it's useful in getting Protestants to become Catholic. And that I find problematic. So here are my nine problems with defining merit as not earned. If merit means not earned, then why is it that prayer, let me, let me take you to the, to the, to the, uh, to the scene where I got all the stuff. All right. Why is it that prayer in the Council of Trent is a free and unmerited gift. If merit doesn't even mean earn, why do we need to, to say that prayer is free and unmerited? That, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. In the Council of Trent, did you know that the word earn is never used? In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, this massive book, the word earn is never used. It always uses merit. Meaning where you would expect to find earn, it just uses the word merit implying that there's some synonymous relationship between the two words. So earn is never used in Trent or in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. They use merit when you would think they would use earn. Problem number three. If merit means not earned, then why does Trent and the Catechism say that Jesus merited our justification on the cross? That's in uh, chapter 617 of the Catechism. Jesus merited our justification. Well, you mean he didn't earn it? <laughs> like what? That's obviously not what 
is the word is meant to be meaning in those passages. This is a Catholic apologist thing, not a Roman Catholic thing. If merit means doesn't, uh, if, if the word merit means not earned, then um, why does the catechism say the following two things? Organs donation after death is a noble and meritorious act and is to be encouraged. The free gift of organs after death is legitimate and can be meritorious. Does meritorious means doesn't earn anything? Like what, what exactly does that mean? These are strange things. They don't fit the usage of the word. Why is it then in the Roman Catholic catechism, war crimes are said to merit condemnation? Now I want you to think about this one carefully. Every act of war, it's where like you have indiscriminate destruction of whole cities, vast areas with their inhabitants, is a crime against God and man which merits firm and unequivocal condemnation. The word merit is used here. Roman, the Roman Catholic Church is saying, hey, if you murder whole towns full of people, you merit condemnation. Do you think that they mean by that you don't earn condemnation? Is it candy? <laughs> is it like in, in Trenhorn's analogy, it's candy, but not in the Roman Catholic teaching. This is why I, I like the sources that are like the catechism and the, and the councils more than the modern proponents of Roman Catholicism because they're often trying to get you into into uh, the belief system without necessarily representing it accurately at all times. And that is a problem. Uh, we want to know what we're swallowing when we swallow Roman Catholicism. Merit, obviously there, means earned. You've earned condemnation. All right, let's look at the next one. How about this following quote? Venial sins merit temporal punishment. Venial are like secondary sins. They're like not, they don't cause you to lose salvation on Roman Catholicism, but you, you're going to get tempor temp temporally punished. You're going to suffer punishments for them. Are you telling me that my punishments are rewards like candy and that I don't actually earn them? Is that what we're saying here? It, it doesn't fit Trent Horn's analogy. His analogy is, is designed to get Protestants to become Catholic. It's not designed to help you understand the Roman Catholic Church. Number six, my sixth problem. Why is the same word used of Jesus meriting my justification and of me meriting eternal life? Right? Here's a, a couple different spots. Let me make sure I'm finding it on the screen. Oh, there it is. The merit of good works is to be attributed in the first place to the grace of God and then to the faithful. It's, it's used of both. I can give you guys a, a few other quotes here. Um, this is reason number seven now. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, chapter 1820, it says that these merits, uh, these uh, virtues are infused by God. Here's, the, here's the, the, the pick for you. They're infused by God into the, um, uh, into the souls of the faithful to make them, quote, capable of acting as his children and of meriting eternal life. Okay, it's the same word used, and I'm meriting eternal life just like Jesus merited my eternal life. How about this one? This is, I think, a very good example of how merit seems to carry an earning connotation in the Catechism and in the Council of Trent. And it's hard to get around because it uses the same word in the same sentence to refer to Jesus' action of meriting and mine. Same sentence. Reason number nine. No one can merit the initial grace, which is the origin of conversion. Why can't I merit it? Merit doesn't even mean earn. So I, why can't I? Well, because it means earn. That's why. Moved by the Holy Spirit, we can merit for ourselves and for all, for others all the graces needed to attain eternal life as well as necessary temporal goods. Now, th this is kind of a side note because the Roman Catholic Church has actually defined merit in a pretty official document, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is the definition they give for the word merit. And I want to work through this carefully because I'm not at all trying to misrepresent them, although I'm going to forever be accused of that. <laughs> But I think I'm doing more to educate you on accurate Roman Catholic theology than Trent Horn is in his defense of Roman Catholicism. Because it doesn't help when you tell Protestants these things. We go, wait a minute, I can't believe that. Right? So then they, they make it a can't, it's, it's, it's just God giving candy to us, right? That doesn't work. So here's their definition. In chapter 2006 of the Catechism, the term merit refers in general to the recompense owed by a community or a society for the action of one of its members experienced either as beneficial or harmful, deserving reward or punishment. It's deserving, okay? It's not reward like candy. It's like reward like you get what you deserved. Merit is relative to the virtue of justice, which means it's about just. It's not, it's not just kindness, right? You, it's, there's, an, there's an earning there. There's an equality that goes on there. Now, Trenthorn should say this, but I'll, I'll also acknowledge you guys. The doctrine of merit is super complicated in Roman Catholicism. So they will say that you merit salvation, but you don't do it on your own, right? Stage one, God saves you. He gives you these things. So there's three 
caveats, three things that they're going to say you have to have. Let me give you Roman Catholic theology uh, from God in order to then merit salvation. And first, God makes you and gives you abilities. That's in the definition of merit in the catechism. Number two, God gives you initial justification, which comes with enablement to now earn merits. So he saves me and he kind of empowers me to then work. But I'm the one that does the work. It's like someone hires you, they train you to do the job, they give you the tools, but you better do the job or you're fired. That's a better analogy for merit, for salvation. Number three, and this is interesting, he freely chooses to make you work for eternal salvation. They, they, they say this in a weird way. The merit of man before God in the Christian life arises from the fact that God has freely chosen to associate man with the work of his grace. This is a super nicey, nice way to say it. I'm going to say it bluntly. God says you better work or you're not going to be saved. Right? You are freely associated with his grace. Right? So it's a promise. It's, it's, it's his choice. He didn't have to do that, but he chose to. You have to work in order to get your final salvation. Trent Horn's explanation is different than the actual Roman Catholic doctrine, and his analogy about candy is really misleading. Merit isn't like a job, he says. Let me, let me work on his analogy now. There's two sides of the analogy. Merit's not like a job where they legally have to pay you. I disagree. Um, that may be a little bit misleading. It's not entirely wrong, but it's also not entirely right. Now, Trinhorn works for Catholic Answers, and the same organization on their website has the following um, question and answer, explaining the parable of the workers. And they and you could read it on your screen there. This is Friar Charles Grandin for Catholic Answers, explaining that the parable of the workers is has similarity to how salvation works. God promises the workers pay if they do the work. They all get the pay, and whether you think they deserved it or not isn't relevant. They had a promise, they did the work, they get the pay. That's actually related to final salvation. And I think that um, Catholics using Matthew 20 and that parable shows that Trent Horn's statement that merit is not like a boss is an unhelpful distinction. The next one is... Um, he says that when his five-year-old, and I'm going to quote him now, when my five-year-old picks up the leaves in order to help, I might give him a treat, but I don't legally have to give him a treat. Here's the problems with this analogy. His analogy leaves out the promise element, right? There's no, there's no promise there. Um, let, me, let me just play it for you. In theory. <laughs> Oh, my computer's not liking all the stuff I'm making it do. Oh, man. All right. Let me. All right. Sorry about that. I uh, Can you guys even hear me? Tell me if you guys can hear me in the live chat because I'm not seeing my volume bar do its thing here. All right. I may have to edit out a couple biffs in the video because of the software. XSplit, get your act together. I'm relying on you. All right. Um, this is this is from the uh, the official teachings of the Catholic Church, right? Eternal life is to be offered both as grace mercifully promised to the sons of God through G through Christ Jesus and as reward promised by God Himself to be faithfully given to their good works and merits. See, it's not I can give you candy if I want to, and if I don't want to, I don't have to. That analogy doesn't work. Um, it's promised. If you do the works, you get the thing. This is this is promised. Okay, I'm just trying to represent Catholic theology properly. Also, the second problem with his analogy is he pretends that eternal life is giving a treat to his kid and he might not give it to him. Like, it's no big deal. We're talking about life and death. We're talking about hell and heaven here. That analogy is meant to build bridges to Protestants through misleading analogies, unfortunately. All right, let's look at the next clip, and I hope that it plays without incident. Here's how that can happen. When believers submit to baptism, either for themselves or their children, they do not merit the graces they receive in baptism. There is nothing we can do that pleases God and results in our initial salvation. We just accept the offer of salvation, either for ourselves or on behalf of our children when we're baptized. However, the process of justification has an ongoing element that can be increased through our own actions. My colleague Jimmy Aiken compares this element of justification to light. So think about light. One quality of light is its purity, or how white the light is. At baptism, we're made free from sin. We can enter into heaven. We receive 
pure righteousness from God, pure white light. But another quality of light is its intensity. You could have pure white light that's dim or bright. A justified person, if they do good works, it increases the radiance of that light, the radiance of the righteousness they've been given. A believer who does not do good works would fail to do Jesus' command to let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we need to remember that this increase of righteousness would not be something the believer earned. You don't earn it through any good work that is performed. We can't earn it anywhere. But as God's adopted children, our obedience to God genuinely pleases him. And so he freely rewards us with grace that increases our justification, and it helps us attain eternal life. So, therefore, we can say, as the Council of Trent does, that good works cause an increase in justification, not in the sense of earning justification, but in the sense of meriting it. And as we've seen, this corresponds to what the Bible says about how our works cooperate with grace to lead to an increase in the righteousness God gave us. I've already talked about the uh, earning and meriting distinction, so I'm, I'm going to keep going with that knowledge already in your guys' heads and having already addressed it. But let me walk through some of this. Um, he talks about the two stages here. Great. Finally, we're, we're really talking about two stages now. This is where really I want to focus the conversation too. On stage one, we agree, mostly. <laughs> uh, we, we agree, though, yeah, it comes apart from works, right? But I think there is just the one stage as far as how you get saved. But the experience of what salvation does in your life is ongoing. Um, stage two, though, here's where we disagree. I say there is no second works-based stage in the process of salvation. Trent Horn says the following, and I quote, The process of justification has an ongoing element that can be increased through our actions. Now, it's not that this is an, an inaccurate description of Roman Catholic theology. It's, it's accurate. It's just vague. And it's so vague that it's not helpful. The process of justifica justification has an ongoing element that can be increased through our actions. They look at grace almost like it's um, like it's a substance and you're getting more of it and justification like it's a substance. And you, if you collect enough of it, you, you can then achieve that final salvation. Um, this vagueness on these really important issues is a strategy of Roman Catholic apologists and it's a, it's a concern of mine and, and others who hold hands with them. People who are like, hey, these are just in-house issues, and they hold hands, and then they all speak really vaguely. Nobody knows what's, what they're talking about, but they're like, but they're getting along, and I like that. That's nice. That makes me feel good. And I think it's just not doing a service to um, anybody. I don't want to be rude and cruel or any, any of those kinds of things, but Paul the Apostle seems to give us an example of how to respond when works are being added to the gospel. And in Galatians he ain't nice. <laughs> so I think that we need to put our foot down on it if we're going to honor the Lord. So let's talk about the light analogy. The light analogy is very interesting. Um, this is one of the reasons why I don't do theology from analogies. <laughs> I think that we we use theology, we use analogies to explain theology we already have established, but we don't prove our theology with analogies because otherwise every cult in the world can prove their theologies. Like the mother God cult, well, you have a, uh, a father and mother. Everyone born has a father and mother. If we have a heavenly father, we must also have a heavenly mother. Poof, they just invoke a deity into existence purely by analogy. And um, yeah, there's a lot of problems with that. But the light analogy says uh, the purity of our righteousness stays the same and our justice stays the same, but the intensity increases. Now, I think of justification as an on-off switch. You're either justified or you ain't. But the Roman Catholic theology holds that justification is more like an ongoing thing and you can increase the intensity. Let's keep in mind that until your justification is intense enough, you don't go to heaven. And that all the justification that comes directly from Jesus isn't intense enough for the vast majority of Roman Catholics on their theology. They have to add their works or the works of others so that their justification can be intense enough to enter heaven. That's a pretty big deal. Now, is this analogy, um, in this analogy, what does intensity represent? It represents a lack in the righteousness you have in Christ. Do you, do you feel the problem there? Roman Catholic, you have to understand at least why a Protestant would have pause. Because the implication is that Jesus, his righteousness is not enough. Let this sink in. Your works are going to increase the righteousness that Jesus has provided. And it will make you more justified. This to me is a nonsense idea. It doesn't work. 
Um, we don't, again, do theology from analogy, so I'll just leave it there. But let's talk about the scripture use, and that is let your light show, so shine. Now, it's interesting because this is very clever as a, as a speaker. It's clever to say, here's an analogy from light, and I'll quote a verse that talks about light shining, and it will make it feel like my teaching is biblical. Here's the problem. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. Is Jesus talking about increasing our justification to attain salvation? Uh, no. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Who am I lighting? The world. I'm not, I'm not trying to increase my brightness so I can get access to heaven, right? Let your light so shine before men. Before who? Before men. It's not about me and God. It's about men. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I'm just doing these things to bring glory to God that people would see his goodness and his light and his love through the life that I live. I'm the light of the world. This is entirely about being a witness for Christ in the world. It's not about achieving justification. So that's a, a definite misuse of scripture. So here, recap what Trent Horn did, right? What I, what I see happening here is give you an analogy through doc, uh, that, that tries to establish doctrine, right? Then quote a scripture totally out of context that uses some of the same words as the analogy, light and shining. And then boom, you feel like the doctrine's been proven, but you're just really confused. The bottom line on Roman Catholic teaching is you work for grace. And that is absolutely clear in, in, the, in the official statements of the church. You work and it increases, it merits more grace. That's incoherent. Romans 11.6 says it doesn't work. We'll talk about that next, actually. <laughs> but the works you do merit grace and you get grace sort of little by little. And you try to get enough to get into heaven eventually. But just what Jesus does for you alone is not enough. You got to add your stuff to it. My response to this is in the video clip that uh, Trent Horn plays next about whether grace and works can be mixed. So we'll play that response. Make sure you understand it. Then we'll play Trent Horn's answer. And I'll reply to that as well. Right? Romans eleven six is my go-to verse on this. It says that if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works or merits. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Like that's just, you know, it's like an ego Montoya shows up in Paul's writing of Romans eleven six and says, grace, you keep using that word. I do not think you know what it means. You know, <laughs> I don't think it means what you think it means. I'm really embarrassed that I started to quote that wrong. I apologize, you guys. That's probably the worst thing I've done so far. <laughs> yes. Start to quote the princess bride, incorre bride incorrectly. Oh, man. Oh, I just really, I repent. But um, you get you get the point, right? Hey, I, I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again because I think it like always comes back to Romans 11, 6, it seems, in these discussions that if if it's by grace, it's not of works. What, what do I mean? I mean, like, dude, grace isn't grace if you add works to it. And if it's by works, it's not grace. Otherwise, work is not work. Like, that's just definitionally when Paul uses the word grace, he means not works. When he uses the word work, he means not grace. Roman, Roman Catholicism says, nah, we can combine them. Easy peasy. Now, here's Trent Horn's response. He has a thoughtful response. I think it's wrong, but I think we should consider it and work through it. In Romans 11, Paul is talking about initial salvation and which parts of Israel belong to the chosen people and will be saved. Here's the passage for the whole context. Paul writes, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So, too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And here's the important part. But if, it, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So Paul is saying there are some Jews out of all of Israel God has chosen, not based on their own merits, but based on his grace. The passage isn't saying anything about the value of our works after God has chosen us. But later in Romans 11... Paul makes it clear that through our own actions or evil works, you can be cut off from the chosen people. Paul writes in Romans eleven twenty two, 22, Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Okay, he went through a few different verses there that we should discuss. Um, one of them is just saying... Uh, you know, his explanation of Romans eleven six, And it fits, like it. this works on Roman Catholic theology. You say, hey, uh, Romans eleven six, <laughs> software changed scenes. I clicked you like 20 seconds ago. The, uh, finally, the, um, 
the idea is in Romans eleven six, it says, hey, yeah, if, if you add works to this, it's no longer grace. And he goes, but that's just initial salvation. That's really convenient. That's just initial salvation. That's very convenient. Here's the problem. Where does the passage say that? Right? This is just assumed. It's not proven. There isn't a, he's not working through things that he reads the passage, but he doesn't demonstrate where this shows its initial and not final salvation. Actually, what Paul seems to be doing is something bigger than that. He seems to be talking about the concept, the very concept of grace and works. So we're going to look at some of this a little bit in detail here. He says the passage doesn't say anything about the value of our works after God has chosen us, but that misses the formula. Um, he says, if it's grace, it's not works. If it's works, it's not grace. I think Paul would apply this to anything. That's the meaning of grace, not works. And the meaning of works is not grace. That's how, that's what it means. That That's consistent with what Paul's saying. Even if Paul was just talking about initial salvation, the principle would apply to salvation or any issue. I'm going to give you a car by grace. How much is it going to cost? $500. I mean, maybe that's a discount. But the car, I didn't get the car by grace now. Not not based on Paul's definition here. Um, let's see here. Um, he says, by our evil works, we can be cut off from the chosen people. That's Romans 11.22. He goes to Romans 11.22. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will be cut off. Uh, he interprets this in a mortal sin context. Roman Catholics believe there are certain kinds of sins called mortal sins. If you sin this this way, you lose the grace of salvation and you're unsaved until you go and you have confession and you have uh, penance, basically. So you need you need to be restored. You need to be brought back. Is he talking about moral acts of mortal sin in Romans 11.22 or is that Roman Catholic theology being read into the text? Horn's interpretation is that, right? He says that you too, uh, he, he relies on the idea that you too in this passage, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you will also will be cut off. That that you is talking about individuals who are truly saved, but they might lose grace. Cut off here means losing salvation, right? Through evil deeds, mortal sins, and then continue in his kindness or in his goodness. That must mean, on Trent Horn's interpretation, doing good works and not committing mortal sins. My understanding of this would be that all three of those points I would disagree on. I'd say you too, and I don't have time to do all of Romans, you guys understand, but and I have done all of Romans. I got a whole verse by verse study of Romans on my channel or, or BibleThinker.org. You could see it and you could look at this passage. But in Romans 9 through 11, you too is not individuals. It is Gentiles. It's, it's, it's uh, Jews and Gentiles are the subject matter for three whole chapters, including this passage here. So you too will be cut off. Doesn't mean you individuals will be cut off. He's talking about the Gentiles in general. The cutting off then means that Gentiles will not be the center of where God's work is happening if they don't continue in God's goodness or his kindness. But this is the key. What does that mean? Continue in his goodness, the highlighted phrase on the screen there. Continue in his goodness does not mean do good and don't do mortal sin. Look at the next verse. What are you continuing in? And they also, the Jews, if they do not continue in unbelief, they'll be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again. Faith is the issue not works. Let's go back two verses to establish this as well, that it's faith, not mortal sin. That's the question. You will say branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. If you do not, God didn't spare the natural branches. He may not spare you either. Therefore, if you don't, cons you know, consider the goodness and severity of God. If you continue in God's goodness, you're continuing in the faith. That's the point. You start in faith, you stay in faith, you, you stand in faith. If you abandon the faith, then you can be cut off. That's the kindness you continue in. Let, let's, let's look earlier in the same section of Romans, Romans 9.30, to see the, the thing that Paul wants us to continue in. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, which is ultimately a version, a similar version to what Roman Catholicism teaches, has not attained to the law of righteousness because nobody can. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. This, this is saying that we continue in faith. So Romans is here appealing to continuing in faith. Um, he interprets it as being uh, 
a warning about mortal sin. And that is because Roman Catholic theology drives the interpretation. If you're Roman Catholic, you, you have to let this happen. You're officially not allowed to interpret the Bible on your own, not with any kind of authority, not with any kind of trust. You have to believe whatever the church says. And then whatever that says, that works with the Bible because they say it does, whether it looks like it does or not. Yeah. So let's go to the next one. Uh, now me and Trent Horn are going to interact on the meaning of the Council of Trent Canon 22. I know this is nitty gritty and some people are probably like bored and don't watch the video. I don't care. <laughs> For those who really want to chase down these issues, I think this is a helpful resource because it's going to move beyond the flurry of quick talk and confusion and bring clarity. So here, this is going to be a straw man. He's going to misrepresent me. Um, but that's just what happens. So um, here's another quote from the Council of Trent. By the way, the Council of Trent, like things like, say, the Vatican II, these are, these are official councils of the Catholic Church. They're ecumenical. They're binding. They're considered infallible statements. Okay, so the canons, the parts I'm reading, are considered infallible statements. Here's the next one from uh, Trent 6, Canon 24. If anyone says that the justice received is not preserved, that's the justice we get from God when we get saved, is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of its increase, let him be anathema. Now, if that anathema still applies, there's debate in the Catholic Church. Like some people say, well, that anathema was back then. We don't, we don't anathematize people anymore, but there's no official statement that says they don't anathematize. Like this is the official one. Catholic teaching is very complicated because there's lots of unofficial things floating around Catholicism. I try to stick to the councils because they're the official, you know, considered infallible claims. Um, but they're saying our justification, our salvation is preserved and increased by our good works. So the context is the value of the works we do after baptism. Number 24 says, if anyone says that the justice received is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of its increase, let him be anathema. So it's a heresy to say good works are actually sinful. And it's a heresy to say good works alone get us to heaven. But it's also a heresy to say the good works we do in Christ have no effect on our souls. That's the position Mike is defending. No, it's not. This is so annoying. I'm sorry. Forgive me for being a little personal here. <sighs> Let me quote Trent Horn again. It's a heresy to say that good works have no effect on our souls. And that's the position Mike is defending. What? What? Listen to this again. But it's also a heresy to say the good works we do in Christ have no effect on our souls. That's the position Mike is defending. No, it's not. Like, I just labored so hard to make a point. Trent Horn, come on, man. <laughs> I hate to come on, man, you. <laughs> come on, man. Like, it's 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 just weird. Um, the, the implication of this is that Mike is actually defending a really silly idea that good works have zero impact on our souls. Of course they impact you. I teach it all the time, right? Like, sin corrupts. If you engage in sin, it, it messes you up. It hurts you, even as a Christian. Okay, the thing is that this will then make it look like I'm teaching something really silly. So all he has to do is knock down this really ridiculous view that works have no impact on your soul. Um, he'll keep doing this. He'll keep doing this to me. But his point is to say, all, all I have to do is then prove that works have some impact on us. And then, then his conclusion will be really strong. Conclude that they're needed to increase our justice and gain eternal life. Works have some impact on you. So they must be required to save you, you as you as you increase the light of your justice or whatever. What I really said in the clip he played was that Roman Catholicism teaches grace starts us out, but works will keep us saved and increase our justification. I've only described Roman Catholic teaching from official sources. Horn didn't even disagree with it. He just misrepresented me. So um, let's talk about the next clip. If I can get it to play. <laughs> Just a sec. Sorry, guys. Perhaps the part that pings Mike's radar the most is this part. The justice received is not preserved in good works. 
the whole clip played and didn't even click over visually. I don't know if you guys see it, but I, I don't think you do. All right, so the part that pings my conscience is supposed to be that justice, the justice received is not preserved in good works. Um, he actually misquotes the council here, and I think it's important. I'm going to put it on your screen. Um, he leaves out a very important part, okay? The justice is not just received, it's preserved and increased before God through good works. So it's not just preserved, excuse me. It's increased before God through good works. Um, so Trenthorn gets what I said wrong. He also gets what the Council of Trent says wrong here. It's increased. And you might think it was just a pure accident, but he'll lean on this before. He'll, he'll avoid discussing that the Catholic Church teaches your works increase your justice before God. And he'll focus on just how they preserve it. Um, that's a different discussion. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about his weightlifting analogy now, where he, again, he's just I'm being, I think, more careful with Roman Catholic theology than, than, um, than I'm being credit for, being given credit for. This does not mean you have to do a certain number of good works in order to get into heaven. It just means that when we do good works, it's like spiritual weightlifting. It makes us stronger and more equipped to refuse to say no to the temptations that can lead us to reject that justice we received at baptism, our initial justification. In other words, the more we say yes to God through good works, then the easier it becomes to say no to Satan. And we can't persevere without God. But God also gives us an opportunity to, as Paul says in Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And notice that we do something, we work, but we don't work on our own. We allow God to work through us and cooperate with him in order to do his will. All right, there's a lot to you know discuss there. Um, let me break this down. I don't want to lose track at all of what he's doing. Um, he gives a weightlifting analogy, and he says, and I quote, uh, this doesn't mean we have to do a certain number of good works in order to get into heaven. But I didn't make that claim, did I? Right. So defeating that claim is pointless for the sake of rebutting me anyways. And this is again, again and again, there's this, this straw man set up. And I think that this gives a disservice to you. You're looking for clarity. You want to hear this discussion. Roman Catholic, really defend your position. Uh, Protestant, really defend your position. Engage with each other fairly. And this doesn't help in, in that engagement. And it's just, it's just the reality. Horn, he's not refuting me. He's refuting imaginary me. Um, so my complaint is that your works are, are, are on Roman Catholicism, your works are part of what gets you into heaven. It's not just grace. That's my complaint. It's pretty simple. It's not that there's a certain number. But I'm going to push back on that too, because there is a number. <laughs> but it's not what I'm complaining about. In Roman Catholicism, saints are the people who have achieved full justification. They've either done enough good works or suffered enough in purgatory where they've paid for those sins. And now they are in heaven. They now continue to do good works uh, above and beyond what they needed to get saved. And they can give those good works to you in the form of merits that you engage in. And the church uses these merits in indulgences, which is an ongoing thing today, indulgences. They absolutely still teach this, right? Um, not in, in the same abusive fashion as Martin Luther was against, but it's still an important doctrine. So that means that there's a whole group of people called saints in heaven who have done enough numbers of works and qualities of works that they are now in heaven. And their abundant works beyond what they needed to get into heaven can be used for you. That theology means there must have been some number. Maybe it's different for every person. Maybe it's different. Maybe it's quality and not just number, but there's obviously some sort of measure. But that's not even my complaint, but I'm going to just push back on that and say that would be consistent with Roman Catholic teaching. The weightlifting analogy is that um, if you do good stuff, it makes you stronger. And here's his quote, and more equipped to refuse the temptations to reject that justice we received at baptism. This is vague language for you do good things and it, it helps you so you won't commit mortal sins where you'll go, you know, you'll go to hell for that. Um, but that's not what it means. Let's look at Canon 24 again, because he's responding to my criticism of Canon 24. If anyone says that the justice re received is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, increased, again, he ignores this part and he didn't quote it. He skipped it when he quoted it. But that those works are merely the fruits and signs of justification of obtained and not the cause of its increase, let him be anathema. Notice the increase part is the part they focus on, and they anathematize me because I say exactly what they tell me not to say in this, in this uh, part of the, uh, the canon of, of the Council of Trent. The Philippians 2.12 verse is always used. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this because of how many things I want to cover today. But the Philippians 2.12 verse is, he says, hey, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
the interpretation that often people do is as though it says work for your salvation, right? Do works to obtain salvation. Um, there's You could easily interpret it to say, live out the results of your salvation, right? Why? Because if you're saved, God is working in you to will and do according to his pleasure, right? Like you're going to have fruit. Fruit is the works that you do. It's the fruit. It's not the cause of your justification. It's the result of it. That would be consistent with um, my theology, my understanding of that, I believe. Now, Trent Horn keeps emphasizing that you don't do the work on your own, that you work with God. So let's play that clip. And notice that we do something, we work, but we don't work on our own. We allow God to work through us and cooperate with him in order to do his will. Now, in my explanation of Roman Catholic teaching, I always make it clear that this is the case. That that's why I talk about the two stages of salvation, right? I'm not that the, a lot of Protestants don't get this and they think Roman Catholic salvation is works entirely. But no, it's, it's meant to be a mixture, a harmonization of works and grace. Initially grace, and then finally grace plus works, which I think is incoherent, and it, you lose grace if you add works. Um, but I said as much. I, I've already said this. I don't know why we're talking about it in the video. It gives people the feeling that there's a rebuttal going on. The question at hand is, does adding your works to the grace of Christ compromise the gospel? I think it does. I believe it does. And next I'll mention how Galatians weighs in on this, and Trent Horn's going to offer a response. I'll ask again. Even if you're getting tired, here's my request. Understand my points and understand his response and think of how these interact. Yeah, that's where the, that's where this, if you're going to watch debates, you're going to watch people go back and forth. You have to be equipped with the ability to discern. You can't just be pulled over by whoever has the best posturing. Um, and, and that says me too. I'm, I'm saying this like as a rule, like I could trick you by having good posturing. You got to know the arguments. You got to follow the logic or else you're just going to get lost. But Galatians, the book of Galatians seems to be written against this very idea. Paul's like, hey, you started with grace. Now you're going to be perfected by your flesh. Like, no, you stand in grace. You start in grace, you stand in grace. It's Your whole Christian life is sustained purely by grace, which means you're not earning it. Galatians is condemning people who are seeking salvation in the old covenant instead of the new covenant. These are people who don't want to do good works in cooperation with grace, but instead they want the work of circumcision in order to replace the work of grace. They're saying baptism's not enough to be saved. You also have to be circumcised, which is false because Colossians chapter 2 says that baptism has replaced circumcision. But Galatians does not say works have nothing to do without justification, with our justification after baptism. In fact, they actually say the opposite. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 4 through 6, Paul says, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any avail, but faith working through love. And in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 8, Paul says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So once again, our good works affect our souls. They help us grow close to God. We reap what we sow. But this only happens through God's grace that he's given us because he prepared these good works for us in the first place. Okay, a lot was said there. I'll do my best to try to uh, push through <laughs> some responses. Um, let me show you some context of Galatians. And if you're at all confused about this later, here's what I encourage you to do. Put a Galatians on audio and listen to it every day for the next five or six days. And just listen to it and try to follow the flow of argument. Try to catch the whole letter. What is Paul saying? What exactly are the Galatians doing that he's got a problem with? Really catch this. Um, but we'll look at Galatians 3, verses 2 through 9. So um, Paul's concern is you started in grace but now there's a problem. He says, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Uh, now, the Catholic Church is going to expressly stay, state that obeying the commandments is one of the ways in which you increase your justice and you get finally saved. And Paul says, look, when you first got here, when you first got saved, was it by faith or by works? Obviously, the answer is it was by faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, keyword spirit, remember that, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Spirit is related to faith. Flesh is related to works. 
keep that in mind. It really weighs in on the verse he quotes later on. Then as you look at verse three, um, or verse five, excuse me, we go on. Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, therefore he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He thinks these are different things, right? So, um, yeah, I'll just keep reading here. Uh, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore, we know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham and the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, and you all nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Paul's point here in this passage, I think, is to say that um, the way you got saved is the way you stay saved. And that was by faith apart from the works, apart from works of the law. Trent Horn's explanation of Galatians is different. Right, Trent Horn's version of Galatians is you started in grace, but then you need works, including obeying the commandments, which are in the law, in order to be saved finally, because those works merit more grace, because you need more grace. Paul's point is that you start in grace and you stay in grace, and to depart from grace is to threaten your very salvation. Therefore, you have to honor the grace that you started with by staying in it, right? The way you heard initially. He who supplies the spirit to you works miracles among you. Does he do it by the work, working by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? The way you started, that's the way you continue. Right? Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Having begun in the spirit, are you going to be made perfect by the flesh? Um, now he, uh, oh gosh, there's so much I could talk about with Galatians. I'm trying to race through here. Um, Paul is not, okay, uh, Trinhorn presents it as though Galatians, what they've done is they've said, Hey, we've received the gospel, but now we're rejecting that and we're going to be Jewish instead. And we so it's an either or thing. But in Galatians, it wasn't either or. It was addition, not replacement. So for Trent Horn's point to stand, it has to be replacement, right? They're replacing grace with law, but they're not. They're doing both. And Paul is saying, if you do both, you get you, you lose grace. And that, that this is what scares me about Roman Catholic theology. Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that you are so... Uh, you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ, right? They're not, they're not rejecting the gospel entirely. They're trying to change it. They're altering it. They're saying gospel plus works of the law, grace plus works. This is the issue of the Galatians. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we've preached to you, let him be accursed. This is where the Bible uses the anathema term, and it's for preaching a works-based salvation. That is, I think, the thrust of Galatians. Um, and the uh, the Galatians verse, the one that is used six by Trent Horn as well. I thought I had this later. I don't think so. I guess I didn't have it in my notes. I'll just share with you then. Um, Galatians 6, 8. For he who sows to the flesh will of the fresh flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. This is probably the strongest verse he's brought so far that could be seen as really promoting the idea that, um, you know, you, you need to do works that are good in order to reap everlasting life. But what I think I've shown by showing you those other verses is that sowing to the flesh is also the idea of works for salvation, right? Because he parallels those in Galatians 3. Flesh is works, Right. But if you sow to the spirit, then that means what? You receive grace through faith alone. And I think the reason why this makes, uh, works with this passage, this, you know, understanding I'm presenting is because the word corruption is used and not um, condemnation. You see, condemnation is definitely loss of salvation, but corruption is just loss of whatever you did in the flesh. You who sow to the flesh, if you're not saved, all you have is the flesh. You're not even born again. There is no spirit. You lose everything. There's, there's actual condemnation. But if you're a Christian who sows to the flesh, you will reap corruption or the loss of whatever you did in the flesh. And the only things that, you'll, that will enter into life with you is whatever you do in the spirit. So it's talking about the permanence of things. I don't think it's talking about how we gain salvation, but uh, it's talking about something different. All right, let's look at the covenant issues. Clip number 32. We're getting close to being done. Galatians is condemning people who are seeking salvation in the old covenant instead of the new covenant. Um, 
that's false. <laughs> so uh, Trent Horn wants to say that it, it's one or the other, right? There, here, I'll get on the screen there for you. Hi. Um, they want to, the Galatians, according to Trent Horn, they're switching from one covenant to the other, but that's not what they're doing. They're adding them together. It's a combination of covenants. It's not old versus new. It's I'm going to add the old in with the new. I'm going to add the works in with the grace. It's the combination because the Galatians still believe in Jesus and they still believe in the death and resurrection of Christ. They still have some very essential Christian beliefs. But Paul says to them, they're actually going to be cut off from Christ because they're adding works. Oh, this is a scary warning. And I, I fear that it applies to Roman Catholic teaching. I'm grateful that many Catholics don't understand these issues because I don't want you going down that road, but it scares me. These are people who don't want to do good works in cooperation with grace, but instead they want the work of circumcision in order to replace the work of grace. Again, that's false. It's not either or. They want circumcision and grace. They want Jesus and the death and resurrection and grace and faith and circumcision, and they're going to combine it all, mix it all together, and just, just melting pot, just put it all together. Um, there's no evidence for this given, uh, but building a case is, from Trent Horn, but building a case isn't super necessary on Roman Catholicism because you do not submit the church to the Bible. Like this is considered an impious no-no. You don't make the church submit to the Bible and what the Bible says. You might look in to see how the Bible supports what the church says, but you cannot test the church with scripture. That That's that's against the rules. Um he also says Colossians 2 says baptism replaces circumcision. I won't get into that, but I don't think it does. But I will get into Romans 4. Because Romans 4, 9 talks about this, I think, somewhat specifically. Did they think that circumcision was going to replace? All right. Um, there's the software. Okay, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. This is doctrine of imputation. God just gives us righteousness when we believe. We don't have to increase it. It's his righteousness. It's perfect. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also who walk in the steps of the faith, which are Abraham. Our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Sorry, I've been talking for too long. Not sleeping enough. So was Abraham justified with or without circumcision? He was justified without it. If circumcision, if baptism is the new circumcision, then based on that argumentation, you could be justified without baptism, just like Abraham was justified without circumcision. He just believed. Uh, I think that's kind of important. <laughs> um, Galatians 5.4 shows us that they did not mean to replace grace. They just wanted to add to it. He says, you've become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you've fallen from grace. You see, he's warning them because they they hadn't purposely rejected Jesus. They had unintentionally adopted doctrines that put them in conflict with the grace of God through Christ. And I think this is what many Roman Catholics have sadly done. Sadly done. It was never replacement. It was addition. Do I add law obedience to the requirements of being a Christian? And the answer is no. Paul's warning is that adding them is a threat to grace. And it's why I fear for Roman Catholics. Here's the next clip. They're saying baptism's not enough to be saved. You also have to be circumcised, which is false because Colossians chapter 2 says that baptism has replaced circumcision. Um, there's some com com confusing things that just happened here in this little clip. I know I replayed a clip. I wanted to play that whole section. But um, baptism isn't the thing that makes you saved in Galatians. Faith is. Like that's consistent in Galatians. Just read the whole book of Galatians. So he's making it about baptism and circumcision. It's about faith is the issue. And grace. Um, if they were saying baptism's not enough, also be circumcised, then they aren't trying to replace grace, like Trent Horn says a sentence earlier. It's a mixture of the two. And you can see this over and over again in Galatians. I just recommend you look at it. And Paul puts him in a corner and he says, Oh, I'm not even on your screen. This has got to be weird. How's that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm working on it. All right. Um, the. Uh, the Galatians passage, which which I would point to is Galatians 5, verses 4 through 6, where Paul says, look, if you want to mix the two, you only get one. 
And if you're mixing works and grace, which one do you get? You get works. If you're mixing law and, and faith, which one are you going to get? You're going to get law. And that's deeply concerning. Um, all right, let's let's go to um, clip number 38. Let's see, 30. Here it is. But look at how the gospel is defined. This is in the uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, paragraph 2068. And I quote, the gospel to every creature, they're going to preach the gospel to every creature, so that all men may attain salvation. And look at how they say you get it, through faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments. So you actually get salvation by, I have faith, I have baptism, and we're like, oh, yes, have faith. Okay, get baptized. You should get baptized, even if I don't think that's the cause of your salvation. You should all get baptized. And you should observe the commandments, but these things aren't giving you salvation, but they are on Roman Catholicism giving you that salvation that anybody with a thinking mind who didn't get baptized five seconds ago is, is accountable to do. That's on Catholicism. It's how you stay saved. It's how you maintain it, or even how you get back your salvation. Look, almost every Christian agrees that if you claim to be saved— but you don't keep the commandments, then you aren't saved. Catholics and many other Christians would say you've lost your salvation. Mike seems to be saying you were never saved in the first place. So we, we both agree you have to keep the, the commandments, and Catholics agree with Mike that this does not earn salvation. We can't get to heaven on our own because we need God's grace, but we always go to hell on our own since God doesn't damn anyone. Here, or as the catechism, the catechism puts it this way. God predestines no one to go to hell. For this, a willful turning away from God, a mortal sin, is necessary, and persistence in it until the end. Paragraph 1037. Okay, um, we're, we're, we're jumping around here. <laughs> it's getting into lots of different issues. Um, notice that the law though is present in this in this quote from the catechism and that's that's my point here you have faith baptism and the observance of the commandments and these things accomplish your final salvation that's where the disagreement is and that's where we want to focus um here's what trinhorn says we all agree he says almost every christian agrees if you claim to be saved and you don't keep the commandments then you aren't saved okay we the the, the issue has never been whether people have fruit from their salvation it's been whether works cause salvation so this is he's just being a tricksy hobbit here all right <laughs> Um, he's talking about how you merit salvation, and then he acts like he's talking about evidence of salvation as well, and that's confusing. Why emphasize agreement, right? We, we do agree that, that salvation produces fruit in people's lives, but if you say that's all it is, is fruit, Trent says you're anathematized, you're cursed, you're cursed by God. So what's the point of, of emphasizing agreement on that issue when it's not the issue that I'm bringing up, it's not the issue that we're caring about here today, then he changes the subject to hell and predestination to hell. And I don't know why we're talking about that. So I'm just going to skip it. Next, uh, Trent Horn does a, uh, a thing um, where he says that we agree. And I, I think we should talk about it. So we agree Christians need to keep the commandments. We just disagree with Mike when he apparently says that we don't have any part in the decision to keep those commandments. We agree you got to keep the commandments, but we have a part. We actually do keep them through God's grace. Okay, have to keep them is way too vague of a statement of agreement. I think that you should honor the heart of the law. I don't think you're actually under the Ten Commandments in that same sense. I know people will disagree with me on that. But um, no, the heart of the law, but not the actual commandments that you're under them. No. Um, but he says, we. I'm. this is the weirdest. I'm going to play it again. I got to play it again. Listen to what Trent Horn says. I am claiming. And it's it's weird. It's weird. I don't claim this. So we agree Christians need to keep the commandments. We just disagree with Mike when he apparently says that we don't have any part in the decision to keep those commandments. We agree you got to keep the commandments, but we have a part. We actually do keep them through God's grace. Where did I say any of that? <laughs> I'm just saying you don't earn your salvation. You don't merit increases of justice and you don't merit grace so that you can get eternal life through the good things you do of course you have a part to play in the decisions you make to do good things i i this is so weird everything he said about me was a misrepresentation i didn't misrepresent roman catholicism once I, as far as i can tell right um, as far as i know and i'm open to being corrected on that because that, that would be to me that would be a nightmare that i'm telling you things that they that roman catholic theology teaches and i'm wrong i, I would i would consider that a sin um Trent horn did misrepresent catholicism a couple different times 
like 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 eternal life is presented as candy being given to a kid you know um uh, we're skipping over increasing of grace and just talking about perseverance merit is discussed as not meaning not earning when that doesn't fit its usage in the councils or the catechism these things are weird you you merit grace on roman catholicism think about this you merit grace on roman catholicism that's incoherent roman catholicism adds your works to the works of Christ and says, unless you have enough of these works to add to the works of Christ, you will not have eternal life. I fear that that is a false gospel. And I fear for those who keep promoting it. Now, that's the whole video section that was on justification. I may do another video on this before I answer the question of whether I'll debate Trent Horn or not. Um, I may do another video on this on because Trent Horn in that same video, where I'll just take the second like 40% of the video and deal with it. He deals with purgatory and the papacy and errors in the councils. And there's some really wild things that he says that are in, that would actually probably really help people. It's just a question of time because I'm in the middle of doing this women in ministry study and these things are distractions. I spent several days on this and those are days I'm not working on my project. So will I debate Trent Horn? Um, let me answer first this question. Will I debate at all? Look, I've experimented with debates. I've done about five debates so far. I did two debates on the resurrection of Christ, a presuppositional apologetics. I debated against a presupp apologist person. I'm the classical guy. Um, I did a baptism debate and I did a preterism debate. And in those five debates <clears throat> over the last like couple of years, I've discovered that I don't really like debate. It's a massive investment of time. Um, Maybe you have a per perfect memory, but I don't. So I have to spend massive amounts of time preparing for debates. You prepare for content you never even end up talking about in the debate. Minimum 100 hours, probably much more for me to prepare a debate well. And I'd rather produce other content. Videos that are going to reach people, more people often than a debate would. I get dozens and dozens of debate offers, and I say no to all of them. I'm just not interested in a debate. But occasionally someone I'm, who's asked me for debate, they go to social media and they act like I'm specifically refusing them and that it's like a personal thing and I'm, Mike's scared. He wasn't, doesn't want to debate them. But not everybody does debate, guys. It's just not everybody's skill set. It's not everybody's thing that they're going to focus on. And um, I'll consider these videos good enough. So uh, will I debate Trent Horn? Um, absolutely not. <laughs> I may debate people in the future if I really feel compelled, if a particular debate stands out to me as something really worthwhile. I'm not at all interested in debating Trent Horn because I think he's misleading. I think he misrepresents me. I think he plays games. I think he sidesteps my points. He misrepresents even sometimes, it seems, Roman Catholic theology in places. And I'm like, how am I supposed to debate this? Um, it ends up being a rhetorical battle that doesn't promote clarity for people. And also, he's multiple, multiple times he's gone to social media to try to like stir up people who flood our inbox and make my assistant, Sarah, super busy. And it... And it's rude, okay? So I'm not going to reward rudeness. I did that once before. I guess I've had another debate. I did it once before where a, an atheist like tried to bully me into doing stuff with him. And I, after that, I was like, you know what? Never again. I'm not going to. I'm not going to play those games. If you can't be respectable in the way you approach these issues, I'm not going to. I'm not going to play those games. Um, but you have his videos. You got my videos. You got this response. I'll make one more response, most likely, and I'll get it out hopefully within the next ten years. Uh, hopefully soon. I'll try. <laughs> And if you have the ability to watch this sort of thing, my last encouragement is this. You cannot take my word for it. You can't take his word for it. If you're going to watch these back and forth discussions at all, you need to be able to say, I clearly understand the foundational points they're making and how they're establishing the truth of them. And I understand how so-and-so is pushing back on those points. Because everything I've said, Trent Horn would have, you know, three, 10 hours of rebuttal to. You have to have the ability to discern whether those rebuttals work or fail. And um, I'm just saying this in general. If you're going to watch debates on YouTube, you need to be able to evaluate things and not be pulled along with rhetoric because um, that's a danger to you. So anyway, yeah, um, if anybody wants to debate me, just know I'm, I don't really feel like it. Um, I'd much rather spend that 100 hours preparing three or four great videos that have a much bigger impact than our debate would. I think that's a better use of my time and skill set. So thank you all very much. Um, I think that's about all I got to say, and I will uh, not be seeing you for a live stream until the Friday, the week after Thanksgiving. So that's going to be coming up when it comes up. So thank you, mods, for being here for the epic, epic long live stream. I will do one more. Um, man, you've got to, I have to do the other one, the rest of his video, because there's stuff he gets into that's just, uh, it's wild <laughs> stuff that's in that one. And it'll, I think, provide real clarity.
So I, I, I like to hear your comments. If you thought, if you are one of those who thought Trent Horn rebutted me, maybe you're a Roman Catholic, and you thought Trent Horn had fully rebutted me, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. But if you attack me personally, I'm going to ignore you. <laughs> That's about it. 